The upcoming Future Blockchain Summit coverage is brought to you by Cook Finance, a revolution in DeFi asset management. We're speaking with Hong Feng, CEO of OKCoin, one of the largest crypto exchanges in the world. Hong, welcome back. Thank you, David. Great to be back. Great to have you back. Now, OKCoin has a number of new listings and offerings that uh, are very exciting. We'll talk about that today. Uh, first, let's talk about the uh, crypto markets. Bitcoin, as we speak today, it's up 9%. So huge jump for cryptocurrencies all across the board. It's had a bit of a, a pullback earlier in the summer, but it's rebounded since then. Bitcoin has actually uh, recovered all its losses since, since I would say, July. Um, Ethereum yeah. has not, though. So I want to ask you about uh, sort of the differences between Bitcoin and Ethereum in terms, of, in terms of their performance. In the past, whenever we had a bull cycle in Bitcoin, Ethereum tends to outperform. Hasn't been doing that this summer. Why do you think that is? Yeah. Uh, so I'll give you uh, what I think. Uh, I think this, again, is going back to the fundamentals. Uh, there are two sides of the story. On the one side, from a Bitcoin uh, evolution perspective, we see that uh, over the last six months, it has been in, uh, quote unquote, a, a pullback or consolidation mode from a price perspective. Uh, but if you look deeper into the ecosystem, there are actually a lot of positive things going on for Bitcoin. There is further de-risking for the uh, network. Uh, if you think about the minor exit, uh, exodus from China, uh, which send a huge wave of shock uh, through Bitcoin ecosystem and further to the uh, whole crypto world uh, in uh, uh, earlier this year, May, around May-ish, I believe, uh, April or May. Uh, that uh, seems to have been over. The, uh, the Bitcoin network has recovered from that. The hash rate actually yes. got back to almost the uh, all-time high without any third party intervening. It just naturally go back. That shows the resilience of the network. And then also you see recent, uh, there are a lot of regulatory uh, uncertainty around the crypto space. But Bitcoin is the only, uh, uh, almost quote unquote, the only coin out there that is, uh, there's not much uh, regulatory concern or uncertainty, at least in US. Uh, Fed, both Fed and SEC came out recently saying that they're not going to ban Bitcoin and it's truly decent decentralized. So from that perspective, I think that level of de-risking Bitcoin continues over the last uh, five months, very quietly in the background, which is yes. playing with strength. The other side of the story for Bitcoin is that there are also uh, further uh, development of its uh, value proposition as well in the background. We talked about Bitcoin as a store of value playing out in 2020, and that continues to play out this year, right? When you see the monetary policy uh, continues with various jurisdictions, you see the macro economy and the price actually increases uh, in U.S. as well. People start to feel it. So that uh, still holds. Yeah. At the same time, there's also a, a money uh, proposition developing for Bitcoin. When you see the first uh, sovereign adoption by El Salvador, which followed by a couple of other countries, and most recently including Cuba, that is interesting because that basically opens the door for the much anticipated usage of Bitcoin as the real money, as the unit of account and as exchange, medium of exchange happening. And then on the technological side, uh, in that same sense, Lightning Network is actually scaling very uh, nicely over the last year, since, uh, since uh, starting in 2021. So there are a couple of technical um, KPIs you want to look at uh, for Lightning. Uh, you look at the number of nodes, you look at the number of channels, and you also look at the capacity in the, in the channel. Uh, all those uh, three metrics, the number of nodes uh, almost doubled since uh, January 2021. And the number of uh, uh, channels also almost doubled, uh, actually more than double uh, this year. And then the capacity uh, in the channels uh, reaches about 3,000 BDC most recently. That is, I think, three times increase this year. So that speaks to the exponential growth of the Lightning Network as a potential uh, uh, a competitor or alternative to Visa, MasterCard, all the legacy payment uh, uh, system that it's being built on top of the settlement network, uh, which is the uh, Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I think the so platform could compete. Yeah, the platform definitely could compete with Visa, but we'll still need higher adoption rates of Bitcoin. Absolutely. Not everybody has Bitcoin ready to use for their credit purchases. Yeah. 
Yeah, but we're seeing that playing out for Bitcoin, and that's why we're seeing it recovering uh, most recently. Then on the other side, when we look at Ethereum, uh, Ethereum to Bitcoin, uh, the trading unit generally has been between, uh, so one Ethereum is generally between 0.1 to 0.3 uh, Bitcoin uh, uh, between the end of 2013 to, uh, 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 I would say, uh, March this year. Uh, and then when you look at the uh, uh, after March uh, this year, uh, Ethereum started to pick up uh, in its exchange rate to Bitcoin. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't be saying to 0 0.1, it's 0 0.01 yes. to 0 0.03. And uh, now it's uh, last six months, it's between 0 0.0, uh, I want to say 5 to 0 0.07. Uh, and that was mostly driven by the uh, DeFi uh, uh, rise and NFT rise, which a lot of that happens on uh, Ethereum. But to back to your point of why uh, over the last month Ethereum seemed to be underperforming Bitcoin. On the one hand, you see Bitcoin coming out of that quote unquote consolidation uh, period because of all the fundamental positive trends uh, for that. On the other hand, for Ethereum, uh, Ethereum in 2017, 18, and, and even 19, up to summer of 2020, uh, has been the only smart contract platform out there. But uh, starting from end of last year to this year, there have been uh, a couple of emerging alternatives to Ethereum, mm -hmm. right? including Avalanche, including Polygon, including Solana, which is kind of new, and e even including Stacks, which is a, basically a, a smart contract built on top of Bitcoin. So there are alternatives now, and there are actually mm -hmm. solid alternatives. And then also regulatory uncertainty is uh, a little bit higher uh, for for uh, Ethereum uh, compared to Bitcoin, so I think there is that playing out as well. So so that competitive net landscape and the regulatory uncertainty is playing out. When you think about Bitcoin, there's really no alternative. That's the global uh, money network uh, no, out so there, and it has a huge network. Exactly. Ethereum faces more competition than than Bitcoin in their use cases. Okay, that makes sense. So this is a chart that uh, illustrates your point here. I've rebased the two series to 100 starting from exactly a year ago, Hong. So you can see that start uh, since 12 months ago, Ethereum has still greatly outperformed Bitcoin. Um, interestingly, like I pointed out earlier, uh, you see the blue line, BTC has recovered from most of its losses early in the summer. Ethereum is still not, uh, has not yet peaked its uh, or breached its August highs. So if someone were to say to you, well, I think Ethereum is going to flip Bitcoin in terms of market cap, uh, are you seeing data to support that conclusion? Are you seeing trading volume for Ethereum higher on, let's say, OKCoin, for example? Uh, I don't think that's totally impossible. Uh, but over the long term, I, I, uh, my personal view is that I have a clearer, uh, I see a clearer path uh, forward for Bitcoin as a whole. Uh, Ethereum, there's a lot of upside for Ethereum too, and for all the other alternative uh, uh, alternatives to Ethereum. Uh, and yes. and uh, particularly when you see GameFi uh, coming up as a, a real interesting use case in Metaverse, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. So okay. I think there are possibilities out there, um, but but we'll see. Yeah. I have to ask you before we move on to OKCoin OK because Bitcoin is having a fantastic run in the last couple of days. Do you still think $100,000 is possible this year? Uh, I hold my position, yeah. Long, you hold uh, my position, okay, I, good. I, I, by the way, I'm a boring hodler, so I don't trade, I don't target specific time for exit, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm long-term positive uh, for Bitcoin. It, it, it's, yeah, let's talk about the psychology. It, it's very tempting to trade cryptos because you see these big volatile swings and you think, oh, I got to do something right now. But you could just huddle, right? Tell us, you've got some, uh, tell us about OKCoin's uh, uh, products, your, your earned products, because somebody could just leave it there. And if you are long-term bullish, assuming your long-term bullish thesis is correct, people can just leave it there like a bank account and earn interest on their products. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I, I, I do think people are complicated. Uh, people probably have different portfolio and alloc some allocation is probably for hodling and some are probably for trading and some are for investing and different have, different people have different mix. Now on our platform, you can do anything you want. You can trade, you can hodl, you can invest. You can also participate in the future. Hopefully we can offer more uh, optionality for that. But on the earn, our earn is directly connected to 
protocols uh, out there. We don't we don't touch your money. Uh, it's basically offering different protocol holes that you can actually go through us and go directly into them and yield whatever market yield is out there. Um, and uh, some of the popular uh, uh, offerings are Stacks and recent uh, recently listed Miami Coin. We also have uh, AVAX. We have uh, a couple of others, including Compound and, and uh, uh, Yearn. Um, so uh, that product is quite popular. People like it. Um, it it's always good to give people optionality, right? Let Does the people... APR vary depending on the price? It's very market driven. We don't know what the APY would be. It's really very much uh, very by protocol and within each protocol, within each product, they, uh, it varies on a daily basis. I see. And just in the price, I've heard from several analysts who are more technical in nature. They, they tell me that uh, if, you, if you consider previous price cycles of Bitcoin, 2013 and 2017, each of these cycles have uh, seen Bitcoin rise to a top, uh, mm. hit a double bottom, and then fall down and then stay flat for years. They're saying, well, this could happen again. I mean, it could, it also could not. But they, basically, they're drawing parallels to previous price cycles. Do you have any comments on that? I tend to think that there are cycles for Bitcoin too, just because it, it's naturally designed as a uh, four-year halving cycle. So I think that plays into the supply and demand uh, story. The other side of things is I think the adoption, mainstream adoption of Bitcoin, either as store of value or as money as the uh, kind of a cheap exchange, takes time. It, it comes in waves, right? And people also mentally, psychologically, we are not rational animal. We are emotional. So we tend to get overexcited about some things. And then once we uh, see that we are overexcited, we tend to pull back and pull down a little bit. So there's just natural cycles. Uh, so yeah, I tend to believe that there are cycles. Okay. Uh, and for Bitcoin, probably the, if you zoom out a little bit more, if history tells us anything closer to truth, then it's probably a four-year uh, cycle. Four-year cycle, but 100,000 first before it collapses, right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> oh but again, sure. I'm not betting on. It. <laughs> That's true. That's true. All right, let's talk about OKCoin's newest offerings. Miami Coin is the only exchange where we can buy Miami Coin. What is yeah. Miami Coin first and foremost, and why did you decide to pick up on this project? Uh, Miami Coin is a project built on Stacks. It's driven by a community who really believes in. Uh, a, a experiment like this that can give the citizen uh, in a city a, a tool for participating in the uh, policy making. It's a civic exchange uh, alternative. We, uh, we really like it because we think that it's uh, very much reflecting the ethos of crypto, the ethos of Bitcoin, letting the community decide and then different participants in the ecosystem uh, act on their own uh, interest but somehow uh, hopefully can uh, help uh, the policymaker making the right policy uh, because that reflect gets reflected in uh, how many people will be following the coin, how many people will be, uh, which will be reflected in the market price uh, of the coin, right? And also on the sideline, the city actually get uh, uh, a, a portion of the reserve, quote unquote reserve of Miami coin in, uh, in the pool that they can use as uh, quote unquote income uh, to, yeah. to, 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 to fund their activities. So I think it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting community driven project, a very, uh, very much a crypto ethno uh, driven. And uh, it's very early stage, to be honest, we don't know, just like in early days of Bitcoin, probably very few people know whether this will su a success or not. And similarly here, we don't know whether it will succeed or not. It's very much deciding, uh, depending on how the community will evolve around it uh, and how much more um, mechanism will be built into that, uh, yeah. driven by all the developers on the community. And this leads to my broader question as to how you pick projects to list. There's thousands and thousands of altcoins. Obviously, not all of them are listed on your exchange. How do you pick coins yeah. to list? Yeah, we do have our own policy uh, process and that is in compliant with uh, the general requirement of a uh, listing process, i.e. we don't want to list a security, obviously. So we have a, a, a team that would look at all the kind of project out there, make decisions on uh, where to start with based on how we see the uh, use case of a certain project, uh, where we see the community, uh, both the um, uh, 
uh, the uh, user community as well as the developer community how valid it is, how active people are, how genuinely people are feeling about the decentralized application of that, and also how decentralized that that project is uh, or where it is heading to toward. Then we will put it through a legal and compliance review uh, that would look at all kinds of aspects uh, uh, of that risk. Uh, part of it is is to manage that risk, manage the uh, legal and compliance risk, make sure that it's not a security. But then part of it is also to make sure that we feel that we are supporting a uh, asset uh, or a crypto community that is truly decentralized in its nature. And then the community will make a decision based on different inputs. Uh, and and some, some tokens pass, some tokens don't. Okay, interesting. And you're expanding your, uh, your footprint on Gamify. Tell us about that. We are, we are. Uh, it's, I think this is something that is very interesting and new in 2021, and we are keeping a very close eye on it. I think we talked about uh, this briefly, uh, maybe, when we talk about the overall crypto space. Uh, yeah. I always see this as uh, development by stages, right? First, you see the monetary layer uh, uh, forming its own shape, uh, which is Bitcoin. And then uh, right on top of it, you see financial system, a decentralized financial system uh, taking shape, which is DeFi that we started to see in the last year. And then uh, what is the, the critical next step is really developing use case, developing real utility uh, uh, on top of uh, all those two, two fundamental layers. Uh, only in that way, uh, we don't end up having a financial system playing with itself. You actually have real use cases. And I think for NFT, it started as uh, almost like the art collectible, right? A digital art collectible where mm -hmm. artists can actually help uh, get their own value ascribed uh, and, and, and that can be easily uh, um, transmitted uh, one to uh, peer, uh, peer to peer uh, yeah. digitally, globally. But I think that's only a starting point. And I, I think that uh, just like real life collectible, it's going to be a very niche market. That's my personal understanding. Uh, however, when it comes to GameFi and an NFT application in GameFi, that brings up a whole new world of possibility uh, where you actually can have a uh, virtual reality and, uh, and, and there's our uh, native uh, um, tokens, governance tokens that people can use and can carry from game to game. You know, in, in, re in original game, uh, the, the, one of the challenges that distribution of a game is co not controlled by game creators. And some of those tokens in different games cannot be carried uh, between games. But in, uh, in, in GameFi, now the crypto enabled GameFi and FTF, that is possible. Uh, so I think that is going to be really interesting. Uh, we start to see a real use case being developed now on different smart chains, uh, Solana, Ethereum, and others. I just want to say uh, that I, I was born in the wrong decade. If I was 10, 15 years younger, I would be earning cryptos playing video games. And exactly. then my mother would probably let me play games more than she did before. But uh, I, I want to ask you about the mechanics of how that works. You can still do that. <laughs> it's not, not too late. <laughs> Yeah, maybe my parents will finally be proud of me. It's a combination, GameFi is a combination of DeFi and NFTs, okay? Can you tell us about the mechanics of how this works? Because you could presumably now play video games, like I explained, earn passive income doing that. How does that work? Yeah, uh, look, we, we actually have uh, access listed on our platform, and that is the first one. Uh, and I know that it's actually a, a pretty pricey to enter. I think it's a kind of a, a, hun a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks uh, getting into the game. But once you are in the game, you can actually use that as a govern governance token uh, and to make votes uh, for, the, for the games and also use it to buy uh, different uh, pieces in the game, right? And, and, and there are different pieces uh, of different value. And that can be actually uh, sold to another individual. So I think that it definitely increases the fungibility of the of the token, and also it carries uh, the token itself becomes its own distribution channel. It's amazing how quick access has been, uh, Affinity has been able to to increase. The game itself has been able to uh, grow its uh, uh, user base. It's only two years old game, and now it's like two million user. Yeah, it yep. recently had a, a valuation round as well. Uh, I think at two, three, two to three billion by sixteen Z. So that tells you the ability for a token economic economics to 
actually disrupt the original business model of a uh, of the gaming industry. Uh, basically, the token itself, because of its price, it carries as a distribution uh, mechanism. Don't don't you see exchanges like yourself potentially partnering with game studios down the line, making a game that will include some uh, some aspects of uh, of NFTs that could, that people can actually you know trade on and earn. That that is the direction we are uh, exploring. Uh, we are a huge fan of interoperability, and we believe that uh, yes, we we are uh, historically a, a quote unquote exchange, but we'd like to think of ourselves as a platform as a place where people actually come, they can either buy and hold in, uh, crypto assets, uh, earn crypto assets, or they use it to participate in what they want to participate in. And there's a uh, uh, possibility of working with uh, different game projects uh, to allow them to use the token they buy on our platform and easily get into the games to do those activities is something that we are exploring, actively exploring. People have told me about the metaverse. It's, uh, it's an idea where our lives are more intertwined, we're become more intertwined with virtual reality. So instead yeah. of getting up to go to work, we just stay home and we work virtually in, in virtual reality. They talk, they talk to me about different possible currencies for this metaverse. What do you think those currencies will be? A digital form, the dollar? Could they be NFTs? Could they be another virtual in-game currency that we haven't seen yet? What do you think? I think it, uh, it can be different things. I think uh, either you call it NFTs or uh, uh, game currencies uh, or other digital currencies. It's really a token that you use in a certain quote unquote economy um, to interact with other people, right? Uh, and uh, historically, when we talk about economy, that economy is politically defined. I think what we are seeing as the possibility is that with crypto, that economy is not no longer defined, confined by political realms, but more by people's interest, by people's different uh, activities. And I am a firm believer in interoperability. I think ultimately uh, all these different uh, smart chain contracts uh, platforms where all the different use cases are going to build on, we need to have uh, uh, interoperability between these chains and also between these chains and uh, Bitcoin so that everything ultimately can anchor to the only uh, global internet native money, which is Bitcoin. Uh, but in those economies, um, the quote unquote money of that economy is probably enough. Yeah, that makes sense. Finally, let's talk about a new initiative that you're launching streaming. So you're you're moving into more of the media side. You're going to be live streaming um, every Friday at noon, starting on October eighth. Tell us about this initiative. Why you're why you're doing this, and some of the some of the guests you plan to have on. Sure. Yeah. No, we are not getting into the media business, David. <laughs> We're, we don't have oh. that in today. It's it's more. I think it's more a way for us to interact with our uh, community, with the customer, yeah. and and uh, and uh, one thing that we realize is that uh, in the crypto space, it's very important to uh, um, keep that educational piece and 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 fun element there, um, and that level of community interaction is very important. Um, so we have a recent initiative to start a, a, a quote unquote, a, a live stream show called OKCoin OK Live that comes on every Friday at noon Pacific time. Uh, we are actually going to have uh, some very uh, prominent guests on, uh, including Mayor Sarus from Miami, including the founder of right. Doge, and including doc Dr. Uh, Professor Safadine Emmas, uh, nice. who I believe you have met before on our- Yes, video. you've been on the panel with him on Kiko, so great. Yes. I'm, I'm looking forward to watching this. Uh, will they be, well, we'll put the link down below for uh, people who want to access this. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll put it in the video description. Hong, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Great thoughts as always. Thank you and good luck on your new initiatives. Thank you, bye. And thank you for watching Kiko News. I'm Damon Lin. The upcoming Future Blockchain Summit coverage is brought to you by Cook Finance, a revolution in DeFi asset management.